I am um, Zach Guzman, the host of the community-owned show Coinage. Uh, I'll be moderating this one here. Excited to have Jason Lau up on stage with me, uh, the COO at OKCoin. And Jason, there's a lot to get into, actually, and we have no opener, so we're just going to dive right into this because the crowd's already warm. But last night, Vitalik was talking a lot about this back and forth between decentralized exchanges and centralized exchanges and kind of where we're at. And there's a lot to get into around regulation. There's a lot to get into around customer experience. And we'll start with what he said last night, because he called out two things around sexes and dexes, one being fees and the other being the user experience. And those are the things right now that centralized exchanges have used to stay on top for a while. But now as you see it, and now as we're in this new normal in this bear market, what is your estimation of how those two, centralized exchanges and decentralized exchanges, are interacting with each other right now? Yes, Zach, thanks for that. Um, first of all, I'm not the founder of OKCoin. I'm yes, CEO of OKCoin. We clarify that. Uh, but it's great to be here. It's a, it's a, um, the other thing is, I don't like that whole centralized ex exchange versus decentralized exchange uh, uh, terminology. I think, I think for users, it's very important um, that they have that choice available to them. And it's fantastic that they now do have that choice and ability to choose you know, what's important to them uh, from that user experience standpoint. Uh, so to get down to Vitalik's point about fees and uh, user experience, fees, I think it's, it's very obvious that when you do things off-chain in a centralized manner on a centralized database, it's going to be cheaper, right? That's just established infrastructure. People know how to run that. You get higher throughput. You get just better um, performance out of that at this time. I'm, I, you know, I think uh, you know, we might and we possibly very well could get there on chain. Uh, but at this moment, Vitalik's absolutely right. I mean, the, the, there's a no-brainer there. Uh, and the, but there are a lot of teams that are trying to solve this, right? Maybe with roll-ups, maybe with uh, side chains, or, or maybe even the other layer ones that are trying to approach this uh, scalability and throughput issue. So give it a few years. You know, we're, we're optimistic that um, this develops. I think it's good for users, again, to have choice and for there to be competition. On the, on the user experience front, also a no-brainer, right? It's at this point, um, my mom, my dad can't use a wallet at this point. It's just too foreign. It's too tough. Yeah. Too many steps. Friction's way too high. So uh, for uh, a company like us, we are able to deliver that familiar Web2 experience for them. And again, I think we'll get there on the decentralized front, uh, but might take a little bit of time. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I mentioned regulation, and that's another interesting thing, because so many people think about the US as being the end-all, be-all for where all crypto exists, and clearly that's not been the case. Uh, I'm reminded of the Do Kwon interview that we put out when it was so much focused on how are you going to be regulated in the U.S. And he's like, well, I'm in Korea. It doesn't really matter. Um, but you guys are in 190 different countries, so you're, you're dealing with a bunch of different regulatory markets. I mean, how do you look at maybe that piece in trying to be above board in all of those and which ones are kind of the key players when it comes to driving some of that? Uh Right, you mentioned you know there are a lot of countries that we operate in. Um, we're licensed uh, and headquartered here in the U.S., uh, so obviously we work with the U.S. regulators on the state level, but also on the federal level. Um, we're also licensed in Japan. Uh, we have a, a, a license from the FSA there. So, and also in Europe, we were, we're uh, licensed in Malta. We're licensed in the Netherlands, um, and we're looking at more places. We're working with the Singapore uh, MAS to to proceed. Um, to get our license there. So bottom line is I think there needs to be communication between industry players like us, but also regulators. I think um, there's just been a lot of talking over each other. And behind the scenes, I think there is. There is a lot of work behind the scenes being done to make sure that uh, regulators understand what is happening, how do we run our businesses, and what's good and bad, we think, and, and they think for the industry. It's important that, again, I think that users should have that choice and not have regulation or enforcement end up cutting off uh, a service or something that users actually value. Um, we've seen that in certain places, um, and I think it, that, that's probably the wrong way to do it, in my opinion. There's, there's obviously a way where you know, we can work together industry, stay all stakeholders together and make sure there's that, there's that customer protection. Uh, and security for users. 
Yeah, the, the customer protection piece is interesting because you can think about it in a different, in a few different ways, right? Best price, best execution, all of those things that, you know, you come from the traditional finance world, so you know how all that goes. There's real strict regulations specifically built around that to make sure that customers are getting kind of the best execution around it. And maybe there are still criticisms of the old system and the way that it's regulated too. But how important is that piece of it, right? You mentioned the ease and going back to those two points around customer experience. It's, it's easy, but as we saw with FTX, if something like that goes down, you need the transparency as a user to know all that stuff too. So what, I mean, we've talked about proof of reserves. The industry has been looking at a lot at that pretty closely. I mean, what is the answer if it is all about choice, also making sure that these centralized exchanges are providing the transparency attached to it for individuals to make the right choice. I think, to be fair, I think that's a question uh, that us as a whole are trying to find answers to, right? I think uh, you've been in this space for a while, uh, as yes. have I. Uh, I've aged terribly this last year, <laughs> Jason. <laughs> um, yeah, this year was a bit more well. interesting, I'd say. Um, but. Look, it's, it's a process, right? I think users are learning. Um, and then, you know, the, the type of information they need to do their own research, to understand what they're dabbling in, is also increasing, right? And, and for businesses like us, I think it's on us to make sure that our users are educated and have access to um, the resources that they need. And we, we, at least for OKCoin, we try to make that very clear right up front, you know, when, when a, we, we focus mostly on beginners, you know, we're, we're trying to help them get from their local currency into crypto and learn about all the cool stuff that they can do. So it's not just, you know, not solely about trading or things like that. It's, it's about, um, you know, just understanding and learning. So that initial experience is actually very important in our, in our opinion. And then when they dive into things like DEXs, um, it's tough. I think we're all trying to figure that out. There have been uh, infamous DEX hacks too, right? Sure. Uh, and so it's not like, DEX good, centralized exchange bad, or anything like that. I think even within these, these buckets, there's spectrums. Uh, and transparency is, uh, is something that we should absolutely strive for. Yeah, I think, oh, I think it's pretty fascinating, too, to think about how easy it is to fall into the trap of DEX good, sex bad, or just even regulation good, regulation bad. Because as I think we've all seen, uh, it was a question that was talked about fervently all of 2022. And then we saw how it ended with uh, the FTX collapse. But when you think about those regulations, specifically as a centralized exchange, probably more closely dealing with banking on ramps and off ramps, right? When we talk about fiat and conversions like your mom and your dad using it to move cash into crypto. Last night, Caitlin Long was talking a lot about regulation and particularly what the SEC, uh, you know, all the regulators really are looking to do. And this again is a US specific question. But when you look at that piece of it, uh, kind of blocking off the banking sector from working with crypto. Everyone's looking at that as a major issue, not just for growing the space, but for prices, where development goes. And obviously, if you don't go through a sex and you're just dealing with a DEX, maybe you don't need to worry about any of that. But how big is it when you think about the big players in this space, institutional investors, just cash flooding into crypto? I assume that has to be a major and rather important piece that not a lot of people are talking about when it comes to completely severing the banking relationship with crypto. Yeah, I think um, Silvergate obviously being yes. the most recent, uh, uh, I guess, troubled player uh, in that space. Um, we want to see a thriving crypto and banking and payment system, right? We want a solid infrastructure across the board. And so it's a bit disappointing to see, uh, you know, the, the news around Silvergate, we hope they pull through. Um, but yeah, I think it's this challenge of having certainty and clarity around what you do, especially for financial institutions. Um, you, you've been covering finance and in, 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 uh, financial institutions, institutions for a while. You need that to be able to operate solidly, right? And so um, I think there are some open questions here in the US right now. Yeah. Uh, but luckily, I think there are also, you know, there's a competitive uh, landscape where uh, there are alternatives and there are competitors who will, I think, step in to um, deliver the, the, the sort of services that our crypto industry needs. And, you know, I think this, this we, we've seen this play out in other countries also where there's, um, there's just a bit of hot and cold element to it. Uh, it's a bit cyclical, unfortunately, but um, I'm hopeful that, you know, we get to a place where 
you know, it's, it's just normal, right? Like, ultimately, for consumers, we want it to be easy and safe. Um, and I think we will get there. Well, I mean, what have you seen in those uh, discussions or maybe the developments around it, right? Because, you know, that's another thing where it's easy to say, oh, all of these agencies are set in one viewpoint, that crypto is bad. And if you listen to Caitlin Long last night talking about all these things, and she's been in the room with the Fed and, you know, their, their branches and a lot of these uh, congressmen and women as well. And it's not that. It's not the case that everyone views crypto as bad. Um, so what, I guess, are the most important things that they're trying to make sure is handled? And again, maybe it's different in different jurisdictions, but generally in those discussions as you've seen them, how, how has that maybe been helpful or hurtful for you at OKCoin and just the space in general? Yeah, so first of all, Caitlin is a true advocate and an asset to our industry, right? She's, she's fantastic. Uh, she, she really does deliver true value for us as an industry uh, and, and push us forward too. Um, I think, I think those conversations are, uh, like, like you've identified, there are senators, there are representatives that take a very different perspective on um, you know, how regulation should be executed. Um, and you know, we are also in those conversations and we're trying to make sure that at the end of the day, users need back to, back to our core points, right? They want transparency, they want to understand what they're dealing with. And then uh, companies also deliver on those core tenets of making sure that there is consumer protection. Um, and so how we get there, I think fortunately, at least in the US, there is a ability for us to have a debate yep. and work through those. Um, it is, it's good to have those conversations. Um, and so, you know, maybe pending some legislative action, you know, yeah. we'll, 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 we'll see where we end up. But I'm optimistic that we'll get somewhere uh, that works for all of us. Other countries, you know, they've, they've, I think it's great to see other countries experiment and maybe give us here in the US some data on what works and doesn't. What's fascinating right now is Hong Kong, um, after having been a bit cold over the past years to crypto, now opening up and setting up a regime for businesses like us to register and get a license and operate. Um, there will be limits on how, re how much retail uh, consumers can participate. Um, but I think it's a start. I think it's good. And you've seen the same in Singapore and Japan, like I mentioned earlier. Yeah. And I guess, you know, just stepping back and philosophically thinking about this as the title is setting us up to debate sexes and dexes, but just thinking about it philosophically, like you said, it has served web two kind of simplicity of getting your money into the space, even entering it has served as an on-ramp for a lot of people. And the activity on DEXs has continued to rise quite a bit as well. So, I mean, how do you see those two things interplaying as kind of, you know, the metaphor is once you're in the tent, you know what crypto is all about. You can use a DEX and it takes time and everyone has their own journeys there. But how do you see the two mixing when it comes to the next, I don't know, five years as the space evolves? Because, you know, we're in a much larger ETH Denver venue this time around. There are a lot more people interested in it. There are a lot more people building than there were even just a year ago. So. I don't know what the future looks like to you. Yeah, I, I, um, this ETH Denver, by the way, has just been amazing to see all the energy and all the people building and, and experimenting on new things. That's, um, that's, just, that's just so bullish for the industry and, and as a whole going forward. Uh, so on, on our side, as part of our larger group, we have uh, OKX as part of our group. And OKX actually does take a almost self-disruptive um, approach to that. We have, we have this Web3 wallet and, and interface where we do connect and support all the DEXs uh, and make sure users can you know, compare and, and learn about how to use a on-chain experience. Um, and so you, we also saw Coinbase right, launch, launch a layer two. I think companies like us do know that the future is that way, right? Um, it will take time to get there and we will need to help users understand why we need to go there. Uh, and so that's our role as, as a centralized exchange. We want to onboard, we want to expand, we want to educate, we want to make sure users get a good experience and then gradually progress through the spectrum of decentralization or, or whatever, the path towards a, a decentralized uh, a, a future. And to be fair, not everyone's going to get there. Not everyone even needs to get there. Again, we need to have choice, right? We need to have solid options for users um, up and down the spectrum and make sure they know what they're doing. Uh, I think all of us have a part to play in that. Uh, so yeah, I, I think many of our companies you'll see will try to disrupt ourselves 
uh, because that's in core to our mission and core to our, our, uh, our um, existence is to get there, right? Get to that decentralized uh, land or whatever. Utopia yeah. of decentralization. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you know, but it is interesting because that theme is obviously it's been around the crypto scene since Bitcoin was launched is all about, you know, decentralizing whatever it may be. Um, and specifically on that, I don't know, let's talk about risks because sometimes I feel like, you know, in fireside chats, we don't talk about what is looming beyond just regulation, but what are the actual problems and what's being solved. And when you talk about centralization, I guess 2022 was weird and I kind of had a front row seat to see both of these things fail because you can talk about FTX, but then also Terra being a project that collapsed, which arguably may not have been decentralized as much as it was claimed to be. but. That was a project that was trying to decentralize the idea of stable coins, and it failed. And if you look at FTX and that failing, obviously there are a lot of technical differences, but panic and people exiting things seems to be a constant theme around that, um, whether it's centralized or decentralized. So when you think about risks in general, and I know you've been in this space for a long time, but when you look at risks as they exist now, is centralization still like one of the tops for you? Is it, is it really needed to continually decentralize everything? Um, my, my personal take is that we don't need to decentralize everything, right? Um, there are, we, we, we always need to think back to why do we need to do that? Yeah. Why do we even need a blockchain for some things? Why do we need a token for some things? I don't know, you know, there are a lot smarter people out there that have maybe found answers to that, but the answer is we don't need to do everything on chain uh, because there are trade-offs to doing so. I think the most important thing is there are trade-offs and there are risks to doing so. Yep. Um, you know, you look, at, you look at DAOs and governance, cool experiments, uh, but sometimes, you know, if some projects are more centralized than they seem, then maybe you didn't need that, right? Um, I, I don't think centralization is a is a bug. Actually, I think it is a feature for for certain services and, and use cases. And I think it's just boils down to we don't want we as in just a, a user. We don't we want to have the ability to use the services and tools that make sense for me. And if that's a decentralized uh, tool or or not, then I should be able to use and choose that. I think that's where we want to get to. For some people, they will want to interface with someone they need to trust and they want to trust uh, a centralized entity, for example. They want to have someone that they could call up if there's a problem, right? That's, that's okay. And, yeah. and we need to recognize that. But at the same time, we should build everything uh, with the expectation that um, choice is, is going to be there and users will increasingly demand that. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things too when everyone looks at regulation, the, the idea of losing choice or like having to play into only one system and having a centralized authority like the government choose exactly what that should be is always dangerous in general. Um, for the last few minutes we have up here, we got about six minutes left. When we talk about looking forward, right, and bold calls, uh, the piece that you just laid out in terms of not everything needs to be decentralized is one that's pretty interesting for me as a man who's now trying to build out a community governed show. Uh, having worked at Yahoo and CNBC, I think decentralizing media is a very interesting use case, but that's for me. And this is a fireside chat with you. But when we think about bold calls looking ahead for the future, as I said, you've been in this space for a long time, really smart guy. What are your bold calls for kind of where we go? Because we've seen these cycles before. I think it's fair to say, last night, if you were here listening to Vitalik, calling us the builder's market right now, uh, for everyone who's flushed out, who is here just speculating, they're gone now, and we've seen that before. But now that you have this kind of new momentum, the bad stuff's out, maybe not all of it, but some of it, what do you see as kind of carrying this over into the next cycle that's gonna be there? Decentralized media is going to be so hot. Thank you. I, I know, but I, I'd love to learn maybe Quoting. later or here about w w what you're doing. But uh, my take is that, um, l l l like you said, you know, we this is our tenth year as a business, um, and we've seen all these cycles play out. Um, lessons learned from our side is that um, you have to keep building. You have to keep investing. Um, you have to keep finding those pain points that users are actually uh, experiencing and trying to solve for those. That, that is the focus, right? We, we, we need to get more people into the space, learn about this space, um, 
and whatever comes of it is, is ultimately going to be useful. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 media usually likes to ask me about like price and you know market sentiment I mean, and all that stuff. I mean, people do like price. That's cool, but like we're here at Eat Denver, we're, we're, let's not talk about price. No, of course. Um, but if you look at yeah, but what's the price going to be, <laughs> Jason? Yeah, in, in a month, what's the price going to be? Um, but if you look at the developer sentiment and activity, all-time highs um, across all types of ecosystems. Uh, there's just so much cool stuff happening. And I think for us, where our mission is to empower the projects and the developers, but also our users and connect them with that, that is so exciting. And I'm just so bullish to see what comes up. It's, it's always not, it's never what you expect it to be. So I'm, 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 I'm uh, 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 you know, shy to, to give a concrete sort of prediction, but look, there's just so much happening. And I think this year is actually gonna be, we're gonna look back at 2023 and think, what an amazing year it was. I, yeah, no, I mean, I think it is always funny that people do harp on price so much, and I wouldn't just ask for a, like a, just throw out a number, but it's always interesting to look at leaders in the space and what metrics they pay attention to. Um, you know, I don't know if I can mention Solana at a conference like this, but you know, we've talked to a few different people in terms of looking at metrics on specific chains and what they're watching to see that they're moving in the right direction. If you look at the space as a whole, what are you looking at to make sure that, okay, there is this piece working well, uh, and I'm seeing an inflection point here, and that's why, maybe don't give us an exact price, but what metrics you're looking at as, as have, that make you extremely bullish on where we're headed. I think, uh, so Electric Capital um, puts out a report on developer activity in the space, and they sort of analyze GitHub commits and everything across different chains. It's always fascinating to see which ecosystems are growing and, and, um, and uh, you know, increasing so you can kind of get a peek at what's happening at the sort of underlying behind the scenes for, for different ecosystems. That's one. Obviously, you want to look at the on-chain metrics, right? Um, active wallets, at transactions, all that stuff. That's usually reflective of something if there's no sort of skewing of metrics. Uh, you know, some, sometimes there's an there's a airdrop or something that, that skews things. But those are very important for us to look forward, right? And see which ecosystems are booming, where's the activity, where are people interested in. And then obviously we have our own internal metrics on users that go and look at, hey, I'm, I'm interested in X or interested in Y. Um, those are also important and that allows us to uh, reach out and make sure that, you know, if users are trying to learn more about X e ecosystem, we wanna make sure those resources are available to them as they progress through that journey. We've got about a minute and a half left, so I'm going, to app, I'm going to wrap with this last question, which, you know, we've seen in these last cycles kind of things leading the excitement and the enthusiasm. I think NFTs were a huge thing that brought a lot of more, like, new people into the space that never touched crypto before, but that was huge. And now it's a weird mix between, like, crypto OGs who don't want to talk about NFTs and they roll their eyes at it, but then you've got a lot of people who are in the space because of NFTs. When you think about this next, like, turning point, does that matter at all? What do you see as the next thing to draw people into the space and into the tent? On the topic of NFTs, I think it's super important that NFTs have, and we should encourage NFTs as a broad concept, right? Um, it's just so much more relatable when you tell someone, hey, look, this is a digital asset that you can own. It's, it, you know, it's yours, it's unique, it's got all these maybe cool colors and art and all that stuff. It's relatable. Like someone walking down the street can understand that. They don't necessarily understand the need for decentralized money and like, you know, the, the state derivatives and all that and stuff. Like, or maybe, yeah, derivatives and complex, you know, options. Like this. That, that's not necessarily, that's cool, but it's, it's niche almost by definition. And so I'm excited, you know, there's now NFTs on Bitcoin. You know, people are really bullish. I've been hearing about that all, all across the conference. It's just fun to see, um, you know, all these ideas, you know, being cross-pollinated across ecosystems. And we should all work to advance those narratives, right? I think everyone should own, a, try and own an NFT, play around yeah. with it. I think NFTs are gonna come back. I don't know whether we're hot or cold right now, but kind of like DeFi 1.0, 2.0, whatever sure. version we're on now, I think we're gonna come back with NFTs that actually have something unique to them beyond just, uh, uh, you know, something collectible. I yeah. think that's sort of version one. Um, it's, it's exciting. Well, as a man who put out NFTs to Cone, his show at Coinage Media, I appreciate that. That's a NFTs good way to end. For, your, for your show, exactly. It's <laughs> a good way to end. All right, Jason Lau, everybody. Thank you so thank much you. for the time. Appreciate it, man. Thank you, Thanks, everybody. guys.